they quit drinking and they're like, I hurt even more. They just turn back to alcohol because that's the only thing that they know. They take inflammatories, they take muscle relaxers. It doesn't work for them. They're kind of stuck with nothing. They'll turn to things on their own like alcohol or drugs. He was uh, addicted to crack cocaine and they used chiropractic and adjusting. He was able to, you know, get, get recovered. The reason why they are turning to, to drugs or alcohol is because they're in pain. Most people, they are in sympathetic mode, they're in fight or flight all the time, and they cannot relax. A lot of people have heard that having a glass of red wine at night is good for you. Wine's healthy, uh, having a beer must be healthy. The research does not show that, that alcohol is healthy for you, even one glass of red wine uh, at night. If there's something that's unhealthy for you and it's gonna hurt your overall health, if it's gonna keep you from achieving the goals, if you're, if you're trying to get in shape and you're trying to be a healthier person, I, I don't think everything in moderation. If you're hanging out with people and they're all drinking and you go, I don't wanna drink anymore and you keep hanging out with that same group, you're gonna fall back out of it. How can chiropractic care support individuals in their sobriety and like recovery journeys? Okay, I'm glad you asked that, Megan. <laughs> so I, I have some studies here um, that I researched in advance. Now, this one is pretty popular. A lot of chiropractors know about this study. Um, so I'll start with this one. And then the other one I brought is basically the same thing. It's just one individual. Okay. So in this study, um, they had a lot of people at a Miami treatment clinic, and they broke them into groups. So I'm going to flip through here. So Dr. Jay Holder is the creator of the torque release technique. So that's the type of chiropractic they used, which is different than the hands-on adjusting. So there's not a popping noise and everything. Um, so a little different style, but they had three different groups. One group in the study was participants received the... Um, standard level of addiction recovery treatment um, and then did not include chiropractic care. The second group, same thing, only they received fake chiropractic care. Um, so they basically turned the machine to off and the patient wasn't sure if they were getting a real treatment or not. In the third group, they did the um, sobriety treatment and then they actually adjusted them. And so after the study was done, the first group, which didn't have any form of chiropractic, fake or real, 74% uh, completed their recovery treatment. In the second group, which is interesting, the ones that got the fake adjustments in the regular care, 56% finished. Uh, but in the third group that had chiropractic and uh, the, the regular treatment, 100% finished. 100%? 100, yeah, every single one. So this Holy one's pretty crap. pretty popular in the chiro world. It was done in 2001, but it was a pretty, pretty big study. So a lot of chiropractors are familiar with this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of treatment facilities will include things like chiropractic or acupuncture to try to help get the best results possible. Wow. So are there specific chiropractic methods or techniques that are beneficial for individuals seeking sobriety? Well, so it's in the chiropractic world. It's the nervous system. Yeah, we're all affecting the nervous system. So it can become subjective or opinionated at that point. Torque release technique or the activator technique, they're all using instruments. Um, you know, hands-on adjustments. There was some research I saw recently where they did find that when you got a hands-on adjustment, you did get a, a more soft tissue stretch out of that adjustment. So I think for many people, even though it's hard to study with a double blind study, manual adjusting, I do think a lot of people would probably get better results with manual. Um, but there are certain situations where I think the tool it does work better for people. So that kind of gets a little bit more um, subjective. So whether you're seeing a manual patient or a, a tool patient, um, I think both would work to help the nervous system. But 100%. Like, that's absolutely amazing. Yes. So there's more studies on, on sobriety and uh, addiction. Um, but I like this. So this is basically the study. But this is sort of a summary of the study. And this was uh, in the Chronicle of Chiropractic. Um, what's neat about this is they kind of go into more of a potential reason why. Okay. Um, so this was on a, a case study. It was a 63-year-old at, at, uh, at a facility, and he was addicted to crack cocaine. So the court ordered him to go to this facility, and they used chiropractic and adjusting, and uh, he was able to you know, get, get recovered. So, uh, but what's neat about this is they kind of go into more of a, a reason why they think it worked. Okay. So basically they said that when you get adjusted, it affects the brain reward cascade. Uh, so this is saying that research is revealing that there is a relationship between abnormalities in the spine, the nervous system, and the brain. Uh, and that was uh, from Dr. Jay Holder, who invented the torque release technique. 
and that ba basic science research shows that the proper development and function of the brain relies on proper structure and movement of the spine from an early age, which I think is pretty cool, which goes back to me wanting to promote chiropractic with kids. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people think chiropractors, they're really good for car accidents and they're really good for, you know, maybe migraines or headaches. Um, and a lot of people don't even know that you can get adjusted as a kid. So, you know, if we, if we kind of push that idea and more kids grow up getting adjusted, they grow up with a better developing nervous system and brain. And even if they never have musculoskeletal complaints, to me, that's, that's more important. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think if that was more, you know, normalized in, in society, if people went to Kairos more and they turned to that kind of stuff more, they would, they would turn to things like opiates less. I think from a developmental standpoint and from an alternative medicine standpoint, you would reduce addiction to alcohol, cocaine, opiates. So that was the, board. the brain reward. Yeah. Um, so, so that's what a lot of us that get addicted, it's the reward at the end of the day or rewarding yourself for, you know, doing something. It's like alcohol or drugs have to be that reward. So you're saying like it can help. Yeah. So there's another study. I didn't bring it with me but my boss and me talk about it a lot at work where there was a uh, study done on uh, smoking cessation. Okay. And so people who complete a program, it usually takes about a year for their brain to change chemically because, you know, when you're not used to smoking, your brain, you know, gets, doesn't have the reward it wants. And, and if you went to a treatment facility, a whole year goes by before your brain chemistry changes. Well, they did a study showing that when you add chiropractic to that, it changes in a month. So a month, is way shorter than a year, obviously, but um, imagine how many chances you have to fall off the wagon and get back into smoking if it takes a whole year for your body to change. So, um, and that works partly with the brain reward system. When you get adjusted, you do get a little bit of a, of a dopamine hit. You get a little bit of a endorphin release. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think what happens when you smoke or if you drink is you get some of that release. And so if you get that with the chiropractic, your brain, I think, can quickly adapt because it's getting it from somewhere else. I've been with some of these people from the beginning of their journey and that four to six month mark is like really hard because they're like kind of like, I don't know, like it's that pink cloud effect. One of my doctors have said that it takes like six months for the brain to start, you know, repairing and stuff after hard alcohol up to, I mean, I've read like other like a year to two years. So you're saying like chiropractic could possibly help like just like speed it up. Yeah, speed it yeah. up. Yeah, just helps the brain adapt faster. And I think people, most people, I don't think realize when you get adjusted, it affects the brain itself. Yeah. You know, I think it's easy to think about the nerves and pain, but when you get adjusted, it, it affects spinal cord, it affects the brain. Uh, they've done functional MRIs where they'll show people doing an activity and they'll measure glucose uptake in the brain and then they'll adjust the patient, have them do the same activity, and they actually are more efficient with how they use that glucose. So the brain itself gets affected. So I think chiropractic, you know, obviously as a chiropractor, I think chiropractic should be more integrated into rehab facilities. But I think also, you know, psychiatry, psychology, uh, even having that part of those groups, I think can help the brain adapt mm -hmm. to even treatments for other issues as well. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. Like, you know, the chiropractic helps the nervous system, the brain, and then you have, you know, psychiatrists that also help with mental yeah. health. Do you have any real life experiences with patients like that have been addicted to anything? Um, so yes, but most of my experience was uh, in Wisconsin. I was in Wisconsin working for the medical facility. There was a, uh, an anesthesiologist named Jeremy who used chiropractic to help keep his opiate addiction down. Um, so not specifically with alcohol, but uh, in the medical industry, um, he told me that the MDs a long time ago, were taught that opiates were not addictive, which we all know is untrue. <laughs> and so he, uh, he was really good about referring a lot of his patients at his pain specialist clinic to chiropractors in the area. Mm. So he would refer to me and refer to lots of people to uh, try to help keep his opiate addiction down. Um, and so by doing that and, and keeping that down, he was able to stay out of hot water. I think they monitor that really carefully. Uh, but he got really good results with that. So uh, he would throw a party every year just to thank all the chiropractors for, oh, um, nice. you know, for helping him out. Um, and so that was pretty, pretty fun. And I used to go into his office and watch what he did. So he would take us through tours and let us see kind of how he managed pain. Um, and that was one of his biggest goals was to just keep opiates to a minimum. If he, if he could get rid of them completely, he would. But in Wisconsin, there was a really big opiate crisis. And a lot of the, a lot of the uh, people addicted to opiates 
started using heroin instead. Oh. And a lot of them weren't who you would think it would be. It was a lot of the elderly people. So a lot of the elderly people were addicted to heroin. And every year when I was there, um, we would run out of methadone um, because of that. And so they had to borrow methadone from other states. And so I guess, you know, years ago, the uh, elderly people would be put on opiates pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And then they found it was cheaper just to go straight to heroin. Oh, my gosh. So, so you're saying you've seen opiate addiction kind of be cured with chiropractic like in that sense because he sent you... I think a combination, getting adjusted and also having him, instead of putting him on opiates by itself, mm -hmm. he would put him on maybe half the dose that he would normally put him on, and then he would put him on uh, different medications that weren't addictive to help manage the pain and slowly wean them off the opiates by using that method and using chiropractic care. Well, because I know a lot of people will turn to alcohol because they are in pain or so they're like in pain, then they're going to you know start taking medicine when really they could... There's so many alternatives out there. Well, yeah, and a lot of people, the re yeah, the reason why they are turning to, to drugs or alcohol is because they're in pain. So if you treat the addiction, but you don't treat the pain itself. So that's another benefit when you're getting adjusted and you're doing things to fix the person's pain, then you are taking away their, the reason why they started it in the first place. Yeah. So that's uh, actually more research I didn't bring with me that I was doing as well on uh, just different topics. I just wanted to be invited back, so I didn't want to give you everything. <laughs> In what ways can chiropractic care specifically address issues that are pertinent to recovery, such as cravings, anxiety, and sleep disturbances? So chiropractic, when you go to school, a lot of the conversation is less about the nerves going to muscles and less about the nerves reporting pain. It's all about the autonomics for chiropractors. So the autonomic nervous system controls the uh, where your blood goes. So if you're running from a bear, fight or flight, you need that blood pushed to your muscles. But you don't need that blood in your muscles when you're eating food and you're trying to relax. You need your parasympathetics to kick on. So your parasympathetics and your sympathetics think yin and yang. The sympathetics are usually activated most of the time. Most people, they are in sympathetic mode. They're in fight or flight all the time, and they cannot relax. They can't turn that off. When you get adjusted, it actually helps your autonomic nervous system be able to switch back and forth better. Oh. So that's one of the things we look at when, you're, when you come to our office is, we scan uh, the skin temperature, and your skin temperature is, you know, your skin's a big organ. So if your body has trouble regulating skin temperature, then we sort of infer, and we've been using this test for chiropractic for most of chiropractic, um, to see if your autonomics can switch. If, if, if it's always the same, if the pattern always looks the same, you're kind of stuck. You can't, you're not adaptable. So when you get adjusted, it helps calm and, and bring you into that parasympathetic state, which helps you heal. So it helps you digest food better. It helps you heal. Uh, it helps you with sleep. Personally, my wife actually went through a, a situation where she had a lot of trouble sleeping to where she had to be put on medication to sleep. And she's now trying to get off of that. So, of course, I adjust her. She goes to an a, a MD who does a lot of nutrition work with her. Um, and with that combination, they're helping her get back into that more parasympathetic activation. And that's what the conversation is. When she talks to me or the doctor, um, it's all about parasympathetic activation and getting out of that, that fight or flight mode. Um, so that's really one of the big reasons why chiropractic, I think, helps with things other than back pain. It helps with things, sometimes digestion issues will get better, sometimes acid reflux will go away, sometimes people will have better lung function with asthma. Um, and now we're not a cure, but a lot of times people will report to us all these positive things that happen when they started getting adjusted. And, uh, and we give credit to the autonomics working better, you know, sleeping better, more energy. Um, and so that's a big topic in chiropractic. And most of the research I like to, to look at has more to do with autonomic nerves and internal health than it does with back pain and neck pain. Well, a lot of people will complain like or say, well, I drink at night because I can't sleep. Yeah. Or helps them relax. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, we don't realize that we our anxiety is so high or, you know, we drink alcohol to calm us, but yeah. really it does not do anything. So besides make it worse <laughs> in the long run. But so chiropractic, you know, can help with anxiety and sleeping. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of chiropractors will give you other techniques to avoid rely. If, if, if all you know is I have a drink and it relaxes me. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, there are other things you could try. You could try getting adjusted. You could try um, exercising in the morning. Um, that really helps me out. So when I exercise in the morning and not only do I have more energy through the day, I sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. um, I do things like not be, I don't watch TV at night and I don't get on my phone at night if I can help it because I don't want to stimulate my brain. Yeah. 
So I, I, you know, there's breathing techniques. There's lots of other op- things that you can try. And then when you're when you go to chiropractors or anybody who's in a wellness industry, they will often go and learn these things so they can educate their patients um, on other things they can try. So, you know, chiropractic, you know, and lots of other things to help just calm people down. Um, and it is hard. I think a lot of people are in that mode. They're you know, they're on the go all the time, and your brain can't distinguish if a bear is attacking you or if you have a deadline to meet your brain and your nervous system will react the same way it'll so that's that's the issue is that most people you know imagine years ago when we were living outdoors and we were being attacked by something our sympathetics would kick on and we would get away but then once that threat was gone we had plenty of time to to kind of switch back where yeah. nowadays it's all day every day you know we wake up there's things we have to do we have to go to work we have deadlines and our body can't get out of that mode because it's not designed to be in that all the time. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think most people are stuck in that situation. A lot of like people in my community, they are always complaining that something hurts. And then a lot of people in my, in my personal life also are like, I ache, I, you know, have all these aches, they quit drinking. They're like, I hurt even more and they're not, you know, doing anything. So they just turn back to alcohol because that's the only thing that they know. So like taking, Like there's other options out there and I don't think people realize that. Yeah. And I I see a lot of patients that come to me from the medical world and they go in and they, they take, you know, anti-inflammatories, they take muscle relaxers. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work for them. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of times it doesn't. And then, so they're, they're kind of stuck with nothing. And so I think they'll turn to things on their own, like alcohol, um, uh, you know, or drugs. But for me, a lot of times when we start adjusting them, their pain reduces or goes away. Um, now, there's other therapies we have in our office, like you know, shockwave therapy, or we call it softwave therapy, um, or lasers that can help mitigate that as well. I think I did the laser and it helped my back. Yeah, so there, there's other options and alternatives. And some people may not know that they exist or that the quality of the technology has improved a lot. Um, and so I think those people, if they, if they were to try going to a chiropractic office and kind of learning more about what's what's developed over the last few years that has um, really helped us keep people away from things like cortisone injections um, and and turning to those things. Um, A lot of people, I think, think chiropractors maybe don't get into other alternatives other than just adjusting. Um, And so even if, even if just the adjustments alone aren't enough to get rid of the pain, you can then couple that with other therapies. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, the uh, physical therapists a lot, a lot of physical therapists nowadays and osteopathic medical doctors are starting to incorporate things like chiropractic adjustments themselves into their strategies as well and kind of forming more of a blend. I think a long time ago it was sort of my thing versus your thing. You know, yeah. PTs, you know, and chiropractors were sort of, it was like my kung fu is better than your kung fu. Yeah, I remember, I mean, like when they wanted me to start physical therapy, I was like, well, I'll just go to a chiropractor. And this was years ago. And they're yeah. like, they looked at me weird and I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't. Well, when I was growing up, chiropractors and MDs weren't really getting along as well. Um, And so I think it was medicine or chiropractic or physical therapy or chiropractic. Whereas now, even the MDs I'm friends with um, are really into supplements and nutrition, and they refer to me and I refer to them. So I think it's not just one size fits all. It's not try chiropractic or try PT or try acupuncture or, you know, try supplements. It's more of finding a customized plan per person. And I think most, you know, chiropractors, PTs, Um, MDs, DOs, I think most of them are trying to think that way nowadays, which I think benefits the patient because it's not, you know, one thing to fit everybody. But I have patients where, you know, maybe the the combination is adjustments and laser, or maybe it's adjustments and spinal decompression, or maybe it's a soft wave and then they go see an acupuncturist. So I think, I think the biggest thing is there's more out there than I think a lot of people realize. And it isn't, if this doesn't work, then give up it's let's find a combination yes I think yeah. a lot of people just want the instant fix and they don't want to put the hard work in but I mean that's what I had no idea that chiropractic helped with addiction and now it would make complete sense because it affects your nervous system and especially that brain reward that like really that was something that really stuck out but back to like everything coming together you said that the DOs and MDs and PTs are all like, you guys are all like coming in a circle now. And it was funny because my daughter got adjusted and I was like, that's weird. I had no idea that like 
our primary care doctor <laughs> would yeah. actually adjust her. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool, I guess. Yeah, D- DOs, uh, they learn it in school, and some of them don't use it. Um, in Wisconsin, I was friends with a lot of DOs, and, and some would use it in their clinics, and some, some didn't feel comfortable doing it. Um, some people use it all the time in their clinics. So the DOs are interesting because they're, they're medically trained. They can do anything an MD can do. They can do surgery. They can do you know medication. Um, but they also get the, um, they call it manipulation education. Mm-hmm. So they do osteopathic manipulation, and a lot of times they'll, they'll do it, and they'll say, well, if that helps, go see a chiropractor. Um, and then, of course, the PTs are now getting trained in it as well. And sometimes they'll do it in their clinics. And if somebody wants to then go to a chiropractor for more of like a proactive plan, then they'll, they'll send to us too. So it's everybody's sort of coming together. We're kind of all blending into each other's worlds. Um, I know a lot of MDs that are re- they won't even prescribe meds anymore. They just do supplements, which is traditionally more of an alternative approach. But I feel like a lot of people kinda, are going more natural. Yeah, everybody's sort of coming uh, together, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody was like, Hey, I'm addicted to opiates or alcohol or cigarettes or whatever, what type of plan do you think that they would need, would they need to see like once a week, twice a week, once a month? Well, so for me, what we do, and not every Cairo does it this way is we start off with an exam. We do computerized nerve tests. Um, what those do is they show us information on the nerves that leave your spine and go to your muscles and your organs. We take that with the patient's symptoms, and then we customize a plan. So if you had a patient who came to me who, who had an addiction issue and had maybe never been to a chiropractor, and I did these scans, and I found there was a lot of things going on behind the scenes with those scans, I would probably give them a plan that would probably be about three times a week. That's pretty common. Probably for about 12 visits, and then I would reevaluate, and then we would change the plan. And a lot of times what we start to do at that point is reduce the frequency Um, And what we're doing in the end is we're changing soft tissue. So what's holding the joints in a position where they can't move properly is the soft tissue. So that's imagine going to yoga and getting flexible. It takes a little while to get there and then things start to loosen up and then it's just about keeping it. So my plan would would start off heavier to make that change go quicker. And then as I taper down, my end goal is to have that patient maybe coming in once, twice a month typically works for a lot of people. Some people come in every week. And they'll just maintain that over the course of their whole life. Yeah. I mean, every time I have an ache and pain, I'm like, I should probably go to the doc, go see Dr. Wagman. But yeah. I mean. <laughs> I mean, I'm here. You can, you can if you want. And now I'm wondering because, I mean, I was seeing you every so. I mean, I'm not a consistent person when it comes to that. But, like, everybody's like, how did you do it? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, now that I think about it, like, being adjusted, I mean, not consistently, but frequently. Maybe it helped with that brain reward. And so I'm taking never, all the credit. Yeah, yes, no. you helped me. <laughs> and like, cause I never, you know, got addicted to sugar after I stopped drinking. And I never, I mean, I hard, like, I have to have something in my hand at all times. I mean, not at all times, but like coffee or like a seltzer water or whatever, like, especially at events. Like, it's just like something, just like somebody that ha- quits smoking. Like, they have, it's that. So that habit. Yeah. So, I mean... Well, I think also when you go to a chiropractor, even when you're feeling good and you're going proactively, when you're in that environment, you know, you're surrounded by posters that talk about health. Your your, your chiropractor tells you to, you know, make sure you're exercising, eating healthy. It's constant reinforcement of the positive as well. Mm -hmm. And I think even just being in the office and being around people who are thinking about health constantly is a good positive reinforcement. Yeah. Um, So even if you're going in and getting adjusted or going in and getting massage, going in and getting laser therapy, you're, you're constantly in an environment that is speaking to you about your health. And I think that helps keep you from falling back off, yeah. you know, surrounding yourself with people who think that way. As a chiropractor, what are your thoughts on alcohol? Like, especially when somebody comes up to you and asks you everything in moderation type sure. attitude. So I know a lot of my patients will come to me and ask, uh, you know, cause I think a lot of people have heard that, you know, having a glass of red wine at night is good for you. Um, and so they'll say, well, wine's healthy, uh, having a beer must be healthy. Um, but in reality, that's not true. So there, the research does not show that, that alcohol is healthy for you, even one glass of red wine uh, at night. So, and then people will say, well, everything in moderation, doc. And it's kind of a way for them to get away with doing unhealthy things in their mind if it's everything in moderation. But to them, moderation, you know, maybe not be one beer a week. It might be five beers a night. And they kind of they kind of use that as an excuse. And I always like to counter with that. I say, well, not really. So everything in moderation isn't true because I don't want you to ever use heroin. 
I don't want you to ever, you know, get addicted to, to crack, even if you're doing it moderately. So I don't think if there's something that's unhealthy for you um, and it's going to hurt your overall health, if it's going to keep you from achieving the goals, if you're if you're trying to get in shape uh, and you're trying to be a healthier person, I, I don't think everything in moderation. I think, you know what, surround yourself, you know, replace the beer with, a, you know, drink a kombucha, go get a home kombucha. It tastes good and it's it's healthy for you. Mm-hmm. So actually replacing things that aren't good for you, even in moderation, just find something else that you can replace it with that's actually healthy. Just do that swap. Yeah. Um, and I think the more you do that and the better you feel, um, you know, you're going to want to do it more. So I think having a beer at night makes you feel good temporarily. But over the long haul, if you instead have something healthy, you may not like the taste as much. You might not feel as good right away, but it's, it's setting yourself up for the long game. You're going to feel good in life. You're going to feel better overall. And you're going to be happier with that than the short-term you know, benefits you might feel with just one or two beers. I like how you said, like, drinking in moderation, you know, like, you're not going to tell somebody it's okay to have heroin or crack yeah. in moderation. I mean, they kind, they definitely are in the same category. And yeah, and if people especially have had addiction to alcohol, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have one, and then uh, at the end of the night, they look back and they had six. Yeah, And I think it's an easy slope to fall down. So I say, you know what? Why, why even go down that road? Why not say, you know, I really, I want to have a drink with my friends. Okay. Well, go hang out with people who don't drink alcohol and they'll, they'll, you'll just, you'll have just as much fun. My wife does this. My wife doesn't, she's never been a big drinker. And, um, she used to, she used to go out with her friends and they would always want to go out and go to bars and, Mm -hmm. and do that stuff. And it just wasn't really her scene. And she would go and she would hang out, but she wouldn't have a whole lot of fun, um, because she didn't want to drink a bunch of alcohol. Well, now she started working as a fitness instructor, and all of her friends are fitness instructors, and she loves hanging out with them because they go, hey, why don't we go to a workout class together? Yeah. Why don't we go and uh, go to the juice bar and hang out? And she actually has a whole lot more fun doing that. So I think surrounding yourself with people who also want to do things that are healthy, I think that's a big part. Because if you're hanging out with people, and they're all drinking, and you go, I don't want to drink anymore, and you keep hanging out with that same group, you're going to fall back out of it. I mean, look, the doc- I mean, you're a doctor, and you literally just said what I tell my subscribers all the time. Find a di- different drink, like, you know, switch it out for a good one and, you know, surround yourself with other people, go do, do different things. And it's like people I don't think realize that, yeah, it's a beer, but there's so many alternatives to drinking something at night versus like well, alcohol. I think when you feel good long term and you don't wake up, you know, if I, if I have a beer, if I have an IPA, for instance, right now, um, I'm 41. If I have an IPA, what do I get to look forward to? I might feel relaxed for a couple hours. I'm going to wake up tomorrow congested because I'm allergic to hops. Um, I'm going to have more wheezing because I have asthma and I, uh, I will, you know, affect my workouts. I go to the gym. I try to go every day. If I have a beer and I go to the gym, I feel like crap. Um, I'm also grumpy. Um, I feel like I'm just in, have lots of inflammation yeah. for two or three days. Um, and so I feel like the, the reward to me isn't worth it anymore. I, if I, if I think about having a beer, um, and I don't have it in the house. So if I think about, oh, you know what? I want to go to the store and get a beer. I have to physically leave my house and go do it. That keeps me from doing it. Um, but also I think about, well, tomorrow I'm going to go to F45 and work out and I'm not going to be able to perform very well. I'm going to feel grumpy. I'm going to be grumpy towards my kid and my wife. To me, it just doesn't, it doesn't really make me happy in the long term. Um, so for me, the short term doesn't justify I would rather I would rather feel good the whole week than to feel good for just a minute and then feel crappy for two or three days. Yeah. So one beer does not I mean it ruins your whole entire next day. An IPA does for me, yeah. yeah which is the only beer I really like, which is ironic. I but, mean, no, I was an IPA drinker too. Yeah. And so <laughs> now I mean, if I do, I will literally have congestion. I will feel grumpy. My I'll get a headache. I feel like my brain has inflammation around. That's just the sensation. Um, and it's for a couple of days just with one beer and, uh, you know, and then I go to the gym or I'll, I'll try to run and I just don't perform well. So I feel like the short term benefit, at least what I think is a benefit and relaxation still hinders the overall feeling good for the rest of the week. So as I get older, I start to realize that's more important to me and, and my mood with my kid and my wife is more important. So you, like you said, the Benefit. I mean, I know what you meant. Brewery like, relaxation. Yeah. yeah. So from your stance, are there supplements that can help? Like I take L-theanine. I don't know yeah. if I pronounce it right, but my 
and peace like actually told me to start taking that and it I think that really helped me ease into not drinking because I would take it at night instead of oh I need to relax I need wine or a beer or a shot like whatever like do you have any supplements similar like that so there are tons of supplements that help you re relax um, I tend to steer towards standard process supplements um, uh, we also use pure and thorn but there's lots of supplements, especially the whole food supplements, where not only is it helping you relax, you're also getting other benefits that are positive for your health. So with a beer, for instance, you might relax, but it's overall harder on your, your body. Mm -hmm. So you're getting unhealthier, even though you're, you're craving that relaxation. It's shrinking your brain. Yeah, it's affecting your liver. So when you take a supplement that helps you relax, especially something that's a whole food, you might be improving the function of your liver. You might also be improving the function of your mm. digestive system. So finding a way to do it and get the same benefit and get that relaxation and to help you get into that parasympathetic state, but also getting a positive overall health benefit, that's pretty cool to me. So I kind of steer towards the whole foods. Um, my wife goes to uh, an MD she's friends with who uses a lot of the pure encapsulated products. And she takes a, a product, um, I forgot the name of it, but she loves it, and uh, it's like called like rest and restore or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually maybe it is a, a functional medicine of Idaho specific product, uh, but she said ever since she started taking that, um, it helps her calm down, it helps her go to sleep. Um, and in the past, I think when she was younger, I think she did have trouble getting to sleep and calming down. I think alcohol was what she used because when you're 20, you just don't know yeah. um, about all these supplements. You just you just you know if that's not what you're around all the time. Well, and sleep while drinking is, I think it's miserable. Like you're tossing and turning and you wake up, you're yeah. hot, you're flushed, you need, you're like thirsty and. Well, if I, if I drink, I will usually wake up around three or four in the morning because it spikes your uh, insulin levels and then your glucose drops. And so you wake up hypoglycemic, you have a headache, you feel like crap. And if you don't know that's what it is, you can't go back to sleep. So you get crappy sleep and then you wake up and can't go back to sleep. So that explains the hangover. Yeah, so if you, if you, uh, experience that, that's the alcohol uh, spike in your blood sugar, causing your insulin levels to go up. And then that high insulin depletes your glucose levels. And then you, you go into a hypoglycemic state, which, you know, you wake up, uh, it'll kind of just wake you up out of a dead sleep. And then you, you have a headache, you can't get back to sleep. And you just feel like crap. How are those biceps of yours coming along? I'm doing F45 now. So Boop. they're a little bit, they're not as big as yours still. <laughs> well, mine have shrunk since Good. Last year. <laughs> Good. Can you explain the fundamentals of chiropractic care and how it contributes to well, overall wellness? Yeah, sure. So a lot of people think about chiropractic care in terms of like back pain or neck pain. So that's pretty common. Um, but chiropractors don't think of chiropractic that way. So chiropractic, when you go to school, it's, it's more to do with uh, the nervous system health. Brain and spinal cord is included in that. So people think about the nerves leaving the spine, but they forget about the spinal cord and brain. So there's actually studies on spinal cord and brain effects from adjustments. Um, so that's how chiropractors think of ourselves. It's more of neurology than it is musculoskeletal. But what's nice is when you get adjusted, you get the benefits of the neurology, but you also get decreased pain. So that's sort of, a, in our opinion, more of a side effect of getting adjusted as opposed to the reason why you get adjusted. But it can also come with a lot of other health benefits, as in like little yeah. kids for ear infections and... Yep. Yeah, so with kiddos, we get a lot of referrals from pediatricians nowadays. Nice. And the top things I've seen referrals for is chronic ear infections, um, colic, and uh, acid reflux. So those are the oh. three that I think pediatricians are aware of. Um, and then we have parents that come in who may have never really been into chiropractic, but their pediatricians will actually make them promise to take them in, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I grew up being a chiropractic child. Oh, really? I don't think my husband has. How, how old were you when you started? I don't know. Probably, I mean, definitely grade school. Okay. I remember falling off my horse one time, and instead of taking me to the doctor, they took me to the chiropractor. Nice. Because I, like, hurt my elbow or something. Okay. And so he just, like, I don't know, did something to it, and it was better. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I was 11. You were 11? Yeah. My parents were, uh, they weren't really into chiropractic. They didn't know anything about it, but my dad was a, a karate teacher before I was born. A karate Karate teacher. Kar oh, sorry. <laughs> and so, and my mom was his student and that's, and so their personality was just, they didn't really like to admit that they had pain. So they, they didn't really take ibuprofen or anything like that, but
but it wasn't because they were holistic. They just, they were just tough. And they're like, yeah. we're not, we, we don't have to let this control <laughs> us. And so that's kind of how I thought as a kid too. And I never really, we didn't really have ibuprofen or anything in the house. But I remember when I was a kiddo, I would get migraines Me too. about every day after school for about an hour. Um, and I would hit my head in the wall to try to like numb it. Yeah. <laughs> Which maybe I'm just weird, but I did that like every day. And then after that would go away, I would go outside and play with my friends. And then um, after about a year, I think one of my mom's friends was telling her about chiropractors. So I went to this chiropractor named Dr. Keaton and uh, she adjusted the occiput, which is the base of the school. And then haven't had a migraine since. And I thought that was pretty cool. So, and having martial art parents, I thought it was cool that you could fix people with like, kind of like martial arts. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of cool. So is that where you like decided you wanted to be a chiropractor? Yeah, so I, ever since then, we I've been getting adjusted and I just thought it was a cool profession. Before that, I was thinking of maybe like veterinarian mm-hmm. um, or maybe medicine, but, but once well, I found are, that. There are chiropractic, or we had a horse one time that got adjusted. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. wait a second, that's a thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, so I've never done it on animals, um, maybe once or twice, but not like professionally. Uh, I don't like charge people for it because I, <laughs> I don't feel like I'm skilled in that yet. But uh, in our school, we had a, uh, a veterinarian who went to vet school and then started Cairo school. And she started a club on campus to teach us how to adjust animals. Oh. But Georgia's kind of strict on that. So before I could join the club, the president of the school actually had to, to shut it down. Because in Georgia, in order for that to happen, the veterinarian would have had to been licensed. And she never got her license. She just went from one school to the next. And so even though she was a veterinarian, because she didn't get her license first, we couldn't do it. But I never learned how to do the animal adjusting. You have a little fun background with your chiropractic. Yeah, so my first office I worked in as an intern was a, a sports clinic, an NFL clinic um, in Alfred, Georgia, called Synergy Release Sports. And I worked with Dr. Zeller, so he was sort of my overseeing doctor. Um, so we saw a lot of famous NFL guys, and a lot of them were, were not even from Atlanta. Some of them were, but they were from all over. So a lot of NFL guys will have a house like in Alpharetta, but maybe they're playing for the Eagles. And so yeah, I used to work with a lot of those guys. And then um, when I graduated, um, they asked me to work there. Hmm. And so I worked there for about a year. Um, but then my wife wanted to move to Wisconsin, and she wanted to be close to her mom. Yeah. So I ended up leaving and going to Wisconsin and working at a medical facility, which was pretty cool, too. So. And I remember you've, you've made comments about sometimes women are harder to adjust than those NFL players. Yeah, so when I was in, uh, when I was in uh, Georgia, I worked on the NFL guys, and so my, my next office was uh, I worked for the county of Sheboygan. So they had, um, you know, the sheriffs needed, needed a chiropractor. So it was a really cool setup because they could come to see me and they didn't have to pay anything. But they were impressed that I worked on NFL guys because they're really big guys. And they said, well, if you can work on them, you can work on these big, big cops. And what I didn't tell them was the NFL guys were pretty easy to adjust. It was, yeah, the little ladies, uh, they're the ones that give me a run for my money. So a lot of women will hold their tension in their neck. And it, there's been some women that I can't adjust. And there's never been an NFL athlete that I couldn't adjust. I've had a chiropractor back, or most of the chiropractors all my life have not been able to adjust my neck until I met you. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm the best one. I was kidding. like, okay, I have to always go to him. I mean, like, there's yeah. no other there's no other choices now because he can actually adjust my neck. I mean, there's been, like, so many times they're like, I'm not going to touch your neck. I can't do it. I'm like, but wait, aren't you specialized in this? Yeah, and some chiropractors, uh, it's kind of like massage therapy. You can go to five different massage therapists, and you may just fit better with one person's style. True. But somebody else may go to that person, and even though they're the best to you, they don't fit that person and they come over here, and just the way their body is, they like this other style better. Yeah. So chiropractors like that, too. So basically, finding the chiropractor that just adjusts the way that your body likes to be adjusted is kind of the, the trick. Yeah. Uh, what stinks, though, sometimes if it's your first chiropractor and they just don't fit the way they adjust doesn't work on you, you might just say, well, chiropractor doesn't work. Well, my mother-in-law had a really bad experience back home, and she's like, I will never go. But she's fine now. Okay. But that was, like, traumatic. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's that's kind of the one of the things I've noticed is sometimes people will go have a bad experience at a dentist and they just go find another dentist. Yeah. But if they have a bad experience at a chiropractor, sometimes the, that's the last chiro they'll ever see. And that's the image they have forever. And so I like when I find somebody who said, well, I went to a chiropractor and, you know, it wasn't it wasn't for me and it didn't work on me. And I go, well, let me try. And sometimes I'll adjust them and go, oh, that worked on me. And so it's it's nice to kind of reintroduce them 
and, and kind of educate them and say, hey, there's, there's lots of different types of chiropractic. The research I brought is not even on the manual adjusting. It's on tool adjusting. Oh, tool adjusting. Yeah. It's actually hard to do research with manual adjusting because uh, in research, you, you ideally want to have a group of people where the chiropractor and the patient doesn't know they're getting a real adjustment. So it's kind of hard to do that with the manual. So mm-hmm. researching chiropractic is uses tools where you can set it to where it's not adjusting, to where the doctor and the patient doesn't know if they're adjusting the patient or not. There's a ton of misconceptions about chiropractic. Like, what makes you so passionate about it? So I think, personally, I feel like I'm a skeptical person. And so if I didn't grow up with it, I might have viewed chiropractic in that same light. So for me, growing up getting adjusted, it always made me feel better. I always went into the chiropractor and left feeling better. I got immediate gratification. I felt better overall. So for me, it just became sort of normal for me to go, and it became unusual for me to go and need an MD. But a lot of people are skeptical of chiropractic, and there's a lot of myths about chiropractic that I don't think are true, and a lot of fear. And I think some of it comes from the visual. So when you watch somebody get adjusted, it looks a lot like the people on the martial art movies. So I grew up watching martial art movies. My first adjustment to be honest, I was terrified because I grew up watching these shows. I watched the chiropractor adjust people and I went, uh-uh, I ain't letting her do that to me. And so she actually had to trick me. So I was seated and she said, I'm not going to adjust you. And she was just feeling my neck and then she adjusted That's me. That's where you get it from. Yeah. So I was, uh, you know, I was, it was shocking. The noise was shocking, but I felt great. A lot of my patients have heard wives' tales. I had a guy come in recently who told me, you know, I, I won't go to a chiropractor because my dad got an adjustment and it really hurt him. Mm-hmm. And and so I grew up with that with that knowledge and I won't go to a chiropractor. And his pediatrician made him bring his daughter to see me for chronic ear infections. So he reluctantly did and it worked really well for her. And so eventually he was on my schedule and I said, uh, so what changed your mind? He goes, well, after we talked, I went back and talked to my dad and it turns out the chiropractor didn't hurt him. He was in a car accident. He had a disc injury. The chiropractor adjusted him he got sore, which is a normal response. It can happen. And so he thought the chiropractor hurt him. But after I talked to him, I think the car accident hurt him and the adjustment made him sore. It just scared him. So I think educating the, the patient before you adjust them is important. If you don't warn them, they might get sore. I think they then think they got injured and they tell all their friends that there was an injury and that kind of spreads. Um, but even if somebody comes to me, let's say I have a 90-year-old and she's terrified of getting adjusted. She has osteoporosis. Her MDs have told her never get adjusted. The MDs don't always know there are other types of chiropractic. So with that patient, I would probably use something like the tools we talked mm-hmm. about in here, which does no popping or crunching noises. Um, it usually doesn't make it too sore. Uh, every once in a while it does. It's very sweet and gentle. And if I introduce people to chiropractic that way and they get some of the benefits and they don't hear the noise that they're associating with us, they start to trust the chiropractic a little bit more. And then a lot of times they'll ask me to do it by hand once they get used to that. Um, but for people who come in who have just, you know, heard horror stories, a lot of times, um, you know, I will just talk about successes. I'll talk about patients I've seen, kids, adults um, who have, who are also terrified, got a few adjustments. It was gentler than they thought, and they walked out with a big smile on their face. So, you know, and as soon as I adjust that person for the first time, it, it all makes sense. Uh, back in my old office, I didn't do any explanation. I had people come in all the time who had never been to a chiropractor. They were there because they were here for the nurse practitioners, and they would see me walking around, and they would say, hey, we, uh, we heard, uh, you know, we don't believe in chiropractors. That's what they would tell me. And I'd go, well, we exist, and i just kind of walk away. And then sure enough, they'd be on my schedule. And then um, I, they would say, well, how does chiropractic work? I don't understand. And I'd say, lay down. And I would adjust them, and they would get up and go, oh, <laughs> right? that feels really good. And so I think, I think the visual is kind of scary for people, and I think the noise scares people. Um, but the big thing is the joint, it should be moving. There should be motion in there. And when it starts to stiffen up and you lose that motion, all a chiropractor is doing is they're taking it back through that normal range of motion that it should already have. Um, there's really very little chance, if any, of an actual injury occurring if done properly. And chiropractic doesn't have to be rough. I adjust people very gently. Um, I'm not a rough chiropractor. And so I think a lot of people assume that to get a good adjustment, it's got to be really hard. And that's the visual they have in their head. But there's lots of different gentle techniques. There's tools. There's gentle manual techniques. There's drop tables. Um, and most people who go to a chiropractor, most people refer their friends and most people enjoy the experience and they leave feeling a little better each time. I mean, I try getting my husband to come, but um, 
Some Apparently some people are hope, some people are hopeless. You can't yeah. save everybody. Apparently he's too crunchy. Obviously you guys go to school for how long? Like it's not well, it's not just a made up thing. <laughs> it's kind of like dental school. It's three and a half years after undergrad. Yeah. Whereas med school is four years after undergrad, so it's very similar. And a lot of the stuff we learn is the same. The only thing we don't learn about is pharmacology, but the anatomy is the same. You know, we learn just about everything I think MDs have to learn in school, um, except the pharmacology, which is a big part of their school. Um, so it's, I think it's more, some people think it's like massage school. It's like a year, but it's, it's, it's pretty involved. We have to take four board exams to protect the public. Um, uh, and they're, you know, on everything from recognizing, you know, cancer on x-rays to making sure that the person doesn't have something that needs to be referred out. That's mostly what boards are doing. So there's very few times where a person goes to a chiropractor that should be at an MD who doesn't then end up at the MD. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into protecting the public, uh, with chiropractic, just like with medicine, just like with, you know, dentistry.